confound those confused contraptions. Despite my best efforts, I could make neither heads nor tails of the mysterious machine that brought me here. If only I still had that jittery, bespectacled assistant of mine from all those years ago. What was his name? Gerald? Gerond? The one that loved tinkering with the devices we'd salvaged from the arms of the island's less fortunate inhabitants. Good lad. The inscriptions he found on the inside of those little trinkets were where I first saw the word Ark, as I recall. Shame about the incident with the Compsignathus. If I still had his services, perhaps I'd never be in this godforsaken desert. Oh, well. Stiff up a lip, Rockwell. Make the best of it. Right then, now that I have found a shady spot where I can enjoy a brief respite from this desert's dreadful heat, it's high time that I set some goals for this expedition. If I wander about aimlessly, then I'm sure to meet the same fate as poor Gerald. First, I shall find a local tribe, if for no other reason than to obtain a proper mount and supplies. Second, I simply must learn more about that strange metal that lined the walls of the sanctuary. Even with a cursory study, I could tell that it possesses wondrous properties. But where could I find more of it? I must say, nothing reminds a man of his own mortality quite like a desolate wasteland. As a strapping young lad, I could have survived alone in this desert for years. Why, on one occasion, I fought off a Bengal tiger with naught but an empty flask and my favourite pipe. With this makeshift spear, the beasts of this land would never have a prayer. Yet in my old age, I can feel this damnable sun sapping my strength with every minute I spend under its unforgiving gaze. Each day I cover less ground than the day before. I must find civilization soon, no matter how primitive. Without the right tools and supplies, I fear that this expedition will be incredibly short-lived. Eureka! At last I have found signs of human life! This afternoon I came across a fresh series of footprints, some from humans and some from, what I assume, a large beasts of burden. I cannot be sure who made them or how civilized they may be, but neither can I afford to be too particular in my choice of saviors. Whoever they are, I must track them down immediately. As soon as I gather my strength, I shall pursue my quarry with the utmost haste and vigor. The tale of the brilliant and impeccably groomed Sir Edmund Rockwell shall not end this day. Salvation, thy name is Prophet's Rest. After a proper meal and some time out of the sun, the makeshift fortress doesn't look half as grand as its name might imply. Yet, when I first sighted its walls from across the dunes, it may as well have been El Dorado itself, so grateful was I to find it. Thus far, I have seen little of the inhabitants, but they seem a hospitable sort. I've been given food, shelter, and even a wet cloth to clean myself with. Quite generous of them, considering how scarce water is in these lands. Their clothing is a curiosity, however. Those robes seem more ceremonial than functional. It seems that Prophet's Rest is less a fortress and more an enclave or monastery. I suppose that would explain the name, now wouldn't it? Yet as strange as it may sound, the natives have created a primitive religion centred around the Ark's obelisks. They pray three times a day, each time facing a different obelisk, and their robes bear a unique symbol a three-pointed star coloured red, green and blue. The blue obelisk appears to receive particular reverence due to its proximity. As charmingly ignorant as their superstitions may be, it's far from the most savage religion I've encountered. Besides, Prophet's Rest is in need of a doctor, and I am in need of supplies. I have discovered why Prophet's Rest is so generous with their water. The well at the edge of the compound is built directly on top of what the locals call a water vein. An endless supply of water bubbles up from beneath the earth. Its existence is a minor miracle, though compared to what I saw in the starlit sanctuary, minor is the operative word. 
I suppose this ark must be floating among the stars, just as the island was. What an extraordinary thought. I cannot fathom how such a thing is possible, but that remarkable metal must be at the heart of it. I am certain. Most of my work as the monastery's doctor has been trivial. Every now and then one of the guards gets injured by the local wildlife, but I usually find myself treating heat stroke and common illnesses. As such, I have had plenty of time to learn all the priests know about the obelisks. All told, they are stunningly ill-informed about the literal pillars of their faith. They are unaware that the obelisks are actually devices that can be activated, and needless to say, they have never activated one themselves. They showed a flicker of understanding when I described the artefacts I found on the island, however. I shall have to keep digging. Unbelievable! Have these idol-worshipping ninnies replaced all their common sense with blind devotion? Have years of oppressive heat completely addled their brains? I was finally allowed to see the monastery's inner sanctum, and lo and behold, there they were. Sitting upon an altar before a flock of protesting primitives were these glowing artefacts, just like the ones I had found in the caverns beneath the island. Yet, instead of making use of them, or even studying them, these halfwits are praying to them. The true value of those artefacts is completely lost on these simpletons. Sacred relics, indeed. It took time, but I finally pilfered enough supplies and tools to survive on my own. Loading them onto these camel-like beasts of burden was laborious, but the real trial was absconding with the artefacts. There is always someone watching the inner sanctum so I carefully studied the guard shifts until I identified whose drink I had to spoil with my knockout serum. Even then, I acted with great haste and guile, for my heist will surely be discovered when the priests convene for their morning prayers. Alas, they will be too late. Sir Edmund Rockwell is always ahead of his foes, but not by a mere step. No. I am miles and miles beyond their reach. It has been several days since I left Prophet's Rest, and I have seen no sign of pursuit. I am unsurprised. They probably assumed that I would make for the blue obelisk as it was nearest. By setting out for the green obelisk instead, I already outwitted those simple-minded zealots. As I said, miles ahead. Miles with those fools out of the way, I can slow my pace and take some time to properly study these so-called sacred relics of theirs. I am curious to see if the materials they are made of bear any similarity to the metal in the starlit sanctuary. The obelisk is reacting to the presence of the artefacts with even more intensity than I expected. Each obelisk on the island required eight artefacts to generate that sort of response, not three. In other words, I may not need to do any spelunking before summoning whatever terrifying beast this ark has in store for me. Ah, the beast. Now that poses an entirely different conundrum. Even with my youth and my favourite pipe, I doubt that I could slay a monster such as that dragon Mr. Nerva fought. Not alone, anyway. I shall need to find a partner for this venture. But who? I have turned back north in the hope of making contact with some of the natives. It is a risk, as I cannot be sure how many bumbling savages are under the sway of that ludicrous obelisk-worshipping cult. But it is also the only region that I definitively know is occupied. I do not have much to offer in exchange for their aid, but I am sure that I can negotiate an alliance with at least one of this Ark's tribes. I was at the centre of the island's diplomatic disputes for years, after all. Why, I am a seasoned, silver-tongued negotiator. Surely I can coax a partnership out of these primitive desert dwellers. What terrible misfortune! My keen sense of direction finally led me to a local settlement, but, as it happened, I was not the first party to visit it that day. That honour belonged to the Burning Phoenix Clan, a band of raiders that were plundering its storehouses and enslaving its surviving residents as I arrived. 
Naturally, the hoodlums fell upon me and stripped me of my valuables within minutes of my arrival. Ruffians! I managed to keep hold of my journal, but little else. This won't do, not at all. Then again, I was seeking out a tribe skilled in the art of violence. Perhaps I can turn this to my advantage. Curse these stubborn brutes! Despite a litany of polite, gentlemanly requests, they refuse to allow me to parley with their leader. Surely any leader of men is not half the imbecile that these barbarians are. I am positive that we could come to some sort of... Oh, damn this noise! It is impossible to concentrate with all this insufferable whinging! Half of these prisoners won't stop moaning about one injury or another, and the other half are in constant hysterics. Very well. Perhaps if I tend to some of the wounded, it will dim this distracting cacophony. At last, I can hear myself think. The guards have moved me to a private cell, and while they have not divulged the reason for my transfer, I suspect that they took notice of my medical expertise. I caught them staring in my direction on several occasions as I worked. It seems that doctors are in high demand in these lands. I suppose that's no great surprise. The island was no different. No matter. While my skills in the realm of medicine are more in line with a field medic than a true physician, I shall continue to play the role as long as it serves me. After days of travel, we finally arrived at the Burning Phoenix Clan's compound, and while my former peers were shuffled to the slave pens, I stood before the clan's leader. I'd heard tales of the once great Tatar empires, though I had never travelled to their lands. By all appearances, Timur is cut from the same cloth as their fabled Khans. He was at once imperious and casual, questioning me with impatience from a throne of hide and bone. Naturally, he was impressed by my intellect and gentlemanly demeanour. Granted, he did not say so aloud, but I was escorted to a small private chamber instead of a cell. Surely, that says as much. I had been pondering why Timur required the services of a doctor. He seemed to be in excellent health, and I had seen no patients since I arrived. Well, now I shall ponder no longer. Timur has a wife, and she's with child. I suppose that even bloodthirsty raiders can fall in love, or at the very least, desire a family. The whole affair would be rather quaint were I not expected to care for the woman and deliver the child. Should either the child or the woman die during the birth, I fear that I will follow them in short order. Nazreen is quite different from her husband. She is a timid little flower of a woman, or rather, she would be if she were not many months pregnant. I am still undecided as to whether my timing is impeccable or unfortunate. A few weeks from now, Timur may have had no need of a doctor, but as it stands, I have been thrust into an unfamiliar scenario with scant time to prepare. Despite my unpleasant circumstances, this whole affair is rather intriguing. I never considered the possibility of new generations being born on the Ark. Yet clearly, it was inevitable. Like any common animal, humans have the urge to procreate. How else could the species endure? Rockwell, old bean, you've done it again. Both mother and child made it through. Timur is a proud father, and your head is still attached to its shoulders. Why, I was even a guest of honour at Timur's celebratory feast. I cannot say I enjoyed the blood sport that serves as the Burning Phoenix's entertainment, but the food was delectable. I was also sure to seize upon Timur's momentary goodwill by filling his ears with whispers of obelisks, artifacts, and the untold power they grant to mortal men. It may take time for those thoughts to turn to action, but with constant care, I may yet turn him into my unwitting general. The silver tongue of Sir Edmund Rockwell has prevailed once again. After spending far too long watching the burning phoenix enslave and decimate hapless caravans and villages, I have convinced Timur to test his might against the guardian of the obelisk. I admit I am somewhat anxious. Timur is not the commander that Mr. Nerva was, and should he fall, I shall fall with him. Yet I have little choice, and the rewards of success are worth the risk. 
the obelisks, the starlit sanctuary, and that precious ore shall be the foundation of my legacy as a scientist, gentleman, and explorer. I am sure of it. I found it. I really found it. Raw, untainted samples of that same mysterious ore from the sanctuary. That fearsome beast must have been guarding it. Thank the heavens for Timur and his berserk savagery. When he leapt from the back of his wyvern, I thought he was surely doomed. But the madman actually managed to grab hold of that monster's horns and turn its eyes into a bloody mess. I have never seen such brutally effective barbarism. Many of his band did not survive the encounter, of course, but that was to be expected. Progress requires sacrifice. And whether those brutes knew it or not, their deaths have helped humanity leap into the future. This ore is simply extraordinary. It is warm to the touch, even during these cold desert nights, and it pulses as though it has its own heartbeat. It is at once light and more sturdy than any natural material I have encountered. The uses one could find for such a substance. I shall have to name it at some point. What would do? Rockwellium? Edmundium? A dilemma for another time. For now, I have more pressing matters. Timur and his burning phoenix savages have played their part, and I cannot remain in their custody. It is time for the great warrior chief to receive his just reward. Alas, poor Timur. He was so focused on celebrating his victory over one foe that he never saw his greatest threat. Now he lies beneath the severed head of the beast he vanquished, eyes bulging and blood seeping from his open mouth. At least that is how I imagine him. I did not stay to admire my handiwork. As soon as the first group of burning phoenix warriors succumbed to their poisoned feast, I stole away into the night, Edmundium and Artifact in tow. Serves those ruffians right, I say. They never did treat me with the propriety that a gentleman and scholar of my calibre deserves. This desert is better off without them. As my withdrawal from the burning phoenix's camp demanded haste, I did not have the time to double-check my supplies. It appears that I shall have to do some hunting. No matter. I may not be as spry as I was when I fell the charging rhino on the plains of the Serengeti, but with the small armoury I managed to abscond with, I can surely manage. I had planned on trading those weapons for information as soon as I encountered a peaceful tribe, but I can spare a few rounds of ammunition. Despite my limited equipment, I have managed to run some initial tests on the Edmundium. Based on my observations, a typical forge may not be enough to smelt a sample of Edmundium ore into any sort of usable ingot. I suspect that it has extremely strong metallic bonds, and therefore a much higher melting point than any conventional metallic element. I must find a proper base of operations where I can run more extensive experiments. I mustn't be over-eager, however. I have limited samples, and... Drat! I shall have to ruminate on this later. A sandstorm may be brewing, and I have no desire to be caught in it. Confounded weather. Not only did that sandstorm separate me from my steed, but when it cleared, I was beset upon by none other than the traitorous Miss Walker herself. Oh, she put on quite the act, spouting all sorts of nonsense about how good it was to see me. Rubbish! I see right through her ruse. I am certain that she is after my Edmundium. The only reason she has not simply looted it from my corpse is that she requires my superior intellect to understand it. Well, two can play this game, Miss Walker. I can fill the role of the benign old scientist for a time, but I shall not be betrayed again. I am glad that I possessed the foresight to hide my presence from Miss Walker after her capture on the island. She clearly believes that I never learned of her betrayal. By cunningly taking advantage of this fact, I have managed to completely deceive the deceiver. The grim old bat she travels with is another matter. I often catch her glaring in my direction, her eyes sharp and mistrusting. If I could, I would deal with her as I dealt with Timur. 
but I fear she is far too observant. For now, I must maintain my deception as best I can. I may have given Miss Walker too much credit. Although I carelessly allowed her to catch sight of my Edmundium ore samples, she was more interested in the artifact I possess. I should have realized this sooner. Miss Walker's specialty is biology. She would not recognize the unique properties of Edmundium if they hit her square in the forehead. That fact has eased some of my tension. Even if Miss Walker seeks to take advantage of my genius, she is focusing on the wrong discoveries. So long as I am careful in my studies of Edmundium, I shall remain miles ahead. I cannot wait to be rid of that glowering menace of a woman, this so-called Wali Alaswad. I suspect the feeling is mutual. She has offered little in the way of farewells while seeing us to this ark's entrance to the starlit sanctuary. Things will be much easier once Miss Walker and I have parted ways with the desert witch, I suspect. Miss Walker is thoroughly oblivious to both the wonders of Edmundium and my knowledge of her underhanded scheming back on the island. She can continue to fiddle with trinkets and relics. I may even assist her if it suits me. Meanwhile, I shall unlock the secrets of the most extraordinary element in the universe right under her nose. <laughs>